That's perfect. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for the coffee. Yes. and the grass takes over out here. <clears throat> I've been fucking high as fuck up on North Rim by myself at night a few times. Um, just completely lost, like navigationally not knowing where I am, <laughs> but probably just like right there. <laughs> <laughs> like 400 yards from the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like being out on North Rim at night is the, is like, if you want to go out into the wilderness in Chico, you just start heading out up at there and there's just like wind and you can see, mm -hmm. you can gaze over out across like the city lights of Chico. Mm -hmm. It's like the perfect um, overlooking the city spot. You can lose sight of those city lights quite easily up here. If you walk on the other side of the, the rise, yeah. If you just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, but the private property fence is on the left the whole way and you can just follow that all the way down and eventually you see the cross yeah. and you know you're safe. <laughs> 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 Won't get lost in Upper Park this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Pilgrim's Progress except it's Google Maps. Yeah. You're like, navigate to Vanity Fair. <laughs> oh, is Vanity Fair a literal place in Pilgrim's Progress? Yeah. That yeah. sounds familiar, yeah. And it's like, you have to like, can, you have to like deal with like the, all the temptations and mm -hmm. the fornicators and stuff along the way. <laughs> Those trying, <laughs> tr trying to fornicate you. <laughs> Those dirty fornicators. Darknesses, stay back. Evil. <laughs> Keep your eyes fixed on the prize. <laughs> sad, sad pilgrim. <laughs> Huge backpack on. Every, everyone he passes is just trying to help him. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, your backpack is way too heavy, bro. <sighs> yep. But when you're taught that you're inherently sinful, then you are set against your biological sensors of pleasure to tell you something is healthy. The way a fruit is sweet to let you know that it's ripe enough and healthy to eat. But if you are set against yourself thinking you're inherently sinful, then the very fact of something being sweet to the taste is supposed to make you suspicious of it. I think it what thus, it is. Thus mm -hmm. are you completely unable to work in the physical world and completely dependent on the priest caste. It's like a war between the, it's a war between people's um, idea of life as the, like through the lens of culture versus through the lens of biology. I feel like there's a power struggle where a lot of times their culture and biology are competing for the same motivations <laughs> where yeah. biology wants to make you do the thing that's healthy for you and it's going to lead to you surviving and having more sex. That's what biology wants you to do. And then culture is, has this level of like um, political power, which is also try to take advantage of the same basic drives. And so there's like a struggle between what feels good and what other people want you to do. Yeah. Because they're competing for the same basic resource, which is your desire. So, is there any specific thing you want to jump in with first? Um, oh, well, I'm gonna take a look at the prompts here. I feel like you had a couple good ones. I can just say them. Yeah, say it. Oh, well, you already have your phone out. You had this thing about, um, so were you re-watching the Circles episode? I was. Okay. Yeah. So good, refresh my memory, you said- It's a good episode. Your rant on circles, sine waves, and patterns of time, opening up glimpses of the future, um, in the circle episode, uh, you compared that to my prophetic perspective I had whilst rolling. 
Yeah, so Finnegan's Wake came into the conversation oh. and concentric storytelling. I remember that now. And Terence will say things about Finnegan's Wake like every paragraph contains a map of the entire book or like the first paragraph contains the entire book or something like that. Yeah, the first sentence somehow, yeah. And there's something about geometry where if you can accurately, accurately see the pattern happening in microcosm, then you can project it out to different scales and see the future potentially. Yeah. Um, and so we had just talked about ecstasy and having a prophetic element to your conversation because you are seeing truth and trying to use your words to frame the truth more and more clearly. Yeah. And something about seeing and stating the truth in really, really um, crystal clear terms was letting you perceive the future in that same crystalline, clear way. Well, that is a good comparison, I think. the Maybe it's like if you have a conversation, a really, just in, in, in the moment of having an absolutely truthful conversation with somebody, that's like a microcosm of your whole life in some sense. Like, it encapsulates the kind of relationship you have, and that's maybe that's why it feels prophetic, is that yeah. you can see in a low res compressed way the picture of that's this person in a in a bigger sense uh like you can maybe see the future in the present except the pre- the future is compressed in the present is compressed into the present the future is like latent within the present and so when you see the present in high resolution you get the sense that you're looking at the future because you normally there's kind of a point at which you can see the future in in, in the present and then when you get a higher like like or another way of saying that is that saying seeing into the present is seeing into the future well the future could only ever be perceived in the present anyway yeah. Because this is the only place yeah. we've ever right. inhabited. Absolutely. <laughs> so far. <laughs> yeah, we only we only see, we're just at different levels of vision at, of the present at any given time. And you know what? Actually, the, the, the zero magnification version of the present is pretty great. I feel like I'm habitually somewhere in between the, the present and the future. Like I'm always looking at the world with a certain level of compression like a certain level of anticipation that I'm trying to figure out what are the, like the, the patterns in it. Um, but that's just habitual because I'm a language using animal. And not only that, but I'm a particularly educated language using animal who's like leans heavily on my decoding sense. That, that's, that's how what's so strange about people now, I think, is that we're like, actually our original state is a little more futuristic to us because we've never been there. We grew up being taught to read. I remember Jade too said something about being on Molly, not that specific night, but a previous night. She was she was feeling prophetic and like saying things that she didn't know yet that yeah. no one had told her. Yeah. Um, or like she didn't go into specifics because maybe they involved like secrets or something. Yeah. Um, but she like knew things that her friends hadn't ever told her. Wow. Or maybe they had and didn't know it. Or maybe. <laughs> or maybe. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's that's like some witchcraft stuff right there. But yeah, seeing the present more clearly or seeing truth more clearly because truth transects I don't even know if that's a word I know what you meant so (laughs) in that sense it is truth transects past, present, and future would you say that's problematic? (laughs) I'm just kidding (laughs) and and there's a way in which Elon Musk sees the future simply because he's deciding what the future is but what gives him the power to decide what the future is 
is his uncompromising uh, coming to grips with uh, the rules of physics and his dismissal of illusion, like ideological illusion, as, as much as he's capable of in any given era. His commitment is to the facts and truth, and, and that does come at a certain cost of uh, creativity, I think, but it does um, open up a clear route into the future um, where other people in his uh, position are more like able to be taken by spells of fancy and like wish fulfillment. And he's, he like couches his wish fulfillment very, very firmly in what he thinks will actually be physically possible. So that's a way in which he's seeing the truth of where we're at and not trying to change the truth of where we're at, just accepting that. And that acceptance of where we're actually at uh, gives him a unique power to uh, see what should happen next. Do you think people? <clears throat> do you think people couch their wish fulfillment with impossible illusions because they're afraid of what would happen if they actually got what they wanted? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Um, I think people, by and large, should take wish fulfillment more seriously. Um, like, uh, I, I don't often come into this season emotionally, but I do come into it uh, and try and embrace as much as I can um, of wish fulfillment. Like, uh, I read all four of the Twilight books, and... <laughs> when? Recently? No, um... So I was say, how do you have the time to be doing this? I don't remember when. Like, eight years ago, maybe? I read all four of those things, and the appeal is very clear of what you read them for. You read them for wish fulfillment, and... You want to hit of this? No. Yes, you do. <laughs> now he's not smoking this morning. <laughs> I'm smoking. <laughs> Your ironclad will is an inspiration to me. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. It really is. I don't mean that in jest. I'm not talking about cigarettes. <laughs> um, those books are all about wish fulfillment and a happy ending. And there's conflicts, like insurmountable conflicts. And then they get surmounted, baby. <laughs> surmounted. <laughs> and yeah. it's, and you get this huge fucking emotional endorphin rush of like seeing dots that can't fucking connect get connected. And because perception is creation and reading is like an ax further accents that uh, perception, that biological process of you have to create something to perceive it. To read that journey of connecting the dots is to create that reality inside your uh, mind of these dots getting connected. Um, it's like the opposite of Romeo and Juliet. It's like Romeo and Juliet both live happily ever after. <laughs> Do they? Because they die, actually. Right. I'm saying Twilight is the opposite. Oh, 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 Twilight, right, 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 okay, yeah. Like, gotcha. it, it works out for them, and they win their families over, and Man. everyone's happy. <laughs> That's why Twilight was so successful. Because everyone got to Romeo and Juliet, and then they fucking died. <laughs> and Twilight's like, what if? It's like, hear me out, Romeo and Juliet, but they don't die. And everyone's like, this yes. is an amazing story. <laughs> it feels yeah. good. It's like, oh, I can fucking breathe their hearts. Everyone say. finally got that, like, oh. Like, <laughs> yeah. Everyone was just, like, edged for, like, a century. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then they finally, popular culture finally fulfilled that wish. Yeah. yeah. And, and then fulfilled it a little too much with <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, they took a little, they took, it was a little too... How do you say? On the nose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, mm. <laughs> But that's how it works, isn't it? Every wish, every wish, every wish fulfillment 
comes with a little bit of an overextension, but you kind of knew what you signed up for when you were going into it, or at least one hopes that you had a sneaking suspicion that you might get a little bit more than you bargained for, and that's okay. That's okay, you'll survive, right? <laughs> I don't know, It's it points out how the ridiculousness of it is baked into the narrative. <laughs> and that, <laughs> What do you mean by that? <laughs> and that gives you subliminal messaging that to dream of a happy ending is inherently ridiculous. In the, in the terms how of- How dare you dream of a happy ending? In the terms of Twilight, it's mm. like, sure, sure, ha- happy endings in a world with werewolves and sparkly vampires. So like this is obviously escapism. This is obviously not the real world. Okay, you know you know it's the way of weaseling out of that problem though, is to realize that there really is no such thing as endings. Uh, I mean sure, but we have the ability to make endings. We have the ability to imagine endings and to orient our life around the idea that things have ended. But that's like where that's I'm getting into some fucking hair splitting here it's getting into some postmodern shit uh, why do yeah. anything why no, set any goals think, well thing. okay that's one ability that's one take on that is going well I'm not even gonna play the game cause eh, I don't give, didn't get what I thought and it's like I my reality can't never line up with can never line up with my imagination and so why bother that's the attitude of that's the postmodern malaise Yes. But it's just like a failure of, it's like you don't have enough gall. Like, of course there are no, in, uh, of course the, f- the phenomenon of beginnings and endings is local to a human consciousness. Uh, yeah. But to a human consciousness, they're really fucking important. Uh, you have to <sighs> be able to see that this week is better than last week. You have to be able to see uh, quantifiably that this year is better than last year um, or else it's just fucking stupid <laughs> well put <laughs> no it is it is uh, sometimes yeah I I wish I could have that much distance from things but some I don't I feel like maybe I don't do that quite as much as you I don't see things as quantized like I don't I guess I don't, maybe, I don't have that idea that, I guess I don't think about it as much. I don't, I don't think about weeks and years and stuff. I think more like I'm more kind of instantaneous in my idea that if I feel like, okay, I'm moving, that's good. I'm not moving, that's bad. I have this, and then retrospectively I look back and I go like, wow, come a long way, okay. And then I and then I decline to think about that as much because I feel like thinking about things distracts me a lot. Where I tr- like my imagination has a way of getting ahead of itself. Where I where yeah. I, I have this sense where I go like you know, like I learned at some point that your imagination is still there even when you're not looking at it, and that it has this gravitational pull that's pulling you along, and that you, practically speaking, just have a choice to go to the next step or not, like. Um, you know, like this podcast is an example. I don't really think about the future of it as much. I perceive the future in that kind of prophetic sense. Like I see the compressed reality of it right now. And I think that's like the whole thing. And I'm just kind of, I'm very like, I expect things to happen, not out of a sense of naivete, but out of a sense of like evidence, like things have happened. So the the only example I have is, oh, because so if things have happened, probably like I had this having this conversation last night that like the best and it came up this idea that the best way of knowing that you that there is some there really is some substance to life there really is something going on here and there's some strength and some benefit to being alive some kind of like point to actually exercise your will is because as far as we know there's never been a single counterexample in any of our ent- whole lives that we haven't done what we wanted to do. In, in like, and you know, this is like in a very strict sense of what you want to do. You, if you look back, you can truly say that you've, I mean, like I have 
like if I'm honest with myself, I look back and I think, okay, I have literally never done anything that I didn't want to do. From the moment I became born, I was born, the moment till I became self-aware to this moment, there's never been a single instance in which I have not exercised my will. Yeah, I've never been mind controlled. I've never been, I've always, now there's been plenty of things that, that felt terrible, that choices that I did that did not feel good, but I still made that choice. So on some level, like I chose. So if, I've, if all I've ever been doing is choosing, I've gotten to this point. I'm, I have a body, I'm alive, I'm not dead. There's a bunch of stuff around me. There's things that are happening. Clearly, there is something to will that you can't get away from it. You can't escape it. There's no, it's not like you have a choice whether to make a choice. You're always making a choice. And you can, and one of your choices can be a super extreme, like abstract version of choice where you start looking at your own life and you're like, what am I doing? What, you're even wondering what you're doing is doing something. There's no getting out of it. There's no escaping. And I like to look at that sometimes and just be like, gee, things are going along pretty well. Like, even without my conscious imagination of knowing what's happening, things are still happening. Mm -hmm. And that's like a ground of being that really stabilizes me to think that like, like the, the idea that like, I think some quote, I think Alan Watts says sometimes, or maybe it wasn't him, maybe he was quoting someone else, but he said like, man suffers under the illusion that if he isn't, that the whole universe will collapse and fall apart if he stops paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. Or like if you don't somehow know and you can't conceptualize what's happening in life that somehow your awareness of something is what is like holding it up, which is, I don't think that's true. I think it, it things are holding themselves up and then it's kind of up to you the extent to which you want to imagine that you're the one who's in the driver's seat. And I don't mean that as like, it's arbitrary. I think there actually is like a tremendous amount of power that can be gained from taking that perspective. But when you do that, you're subjecting yourself to like the larger complexity, the vicissitudes of the world. And it's a question of like pain tolerance. Like, do you want to get the world in you? Because if you do, you have to accept all the world. You have to accept the things that are going to be that sort of like, um, over like not 50 shades of gray, but that's an example of it. Like if you want to write the next twilight book, you have to know that that's going to lead to someone taking that and just being like, well, that worked. Let me do that again. Okay. Maybe not. All right. So it's, it's this mm -hmm. process of give and take where it's like you, if you want, like you, you, you can step into things, but then you have to actually get the thing you, you like part of like, if you really want something that isn't you, if you want to go outside your comfort zone, segue. way. Um, you, you can, uh, you have to kind of be willing to, you have to have this perspective that's like, eh, I'm going to be okay even if I fuck this up. Because mm -hmm. clearly I am okay having fucked up plenty of things in the past and I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. So in the long term, in the long game of things, I think all you can really do is slide back a little bit. But um, that kind of adds like a certain squirrely recursive nature to life where your mistakes are kind of the, the salt in the salt in your future designs. And it adds a little bit of interestingness to it. Like if you didn't have an element of self doubt, I don't think you'd be human. You'd be like an automaton or something. I try to make friends with my self doubt in my most optimistic view of things. In reality, I hate self doubt, but I try to take this generous view of it and realize that it's probably working for me in ways that I don't understand. Well, the Alan Watts quote uh, that if we take our attention away from the universe, it'll like all collapse is, uh, is the local recent understanding about man's position within the universe and man's emerging ego with a perception of separateness and that separateness is handy uh, and useful, but not bedrock metaphysically true. Um, but while you do believe in that separateness, consciously or unconsciously, uh, you're, you, the ego part of your mind is separated from the greater parts of your mind that um, 
come in and out of the unconscious. Um, like you're, you might be unwilling to meditate because if the meditation goes too deep, you're afraid like you won't like find your way back. Um, but that's just a, an immature ego um, thinking that separateness is the rule. Um, and people go like the completely radical other direction with it of like no separateness at all ever, all like unified soup of undifferentiated, like no individuals exist. And then they rob themselves of the discerning, decision-making powers of a sovereign ego. Um, <clears throat> But the ego is uh, couched and supported by a greater mind that is uh, roughly pointed to with the words your subconscious and your unconscious. And at, if, at any given time, your ego is made up of a bunch of disparate private selves that are coming up into being and dying off out of the ego the way cells do in a body. And the ego is always connected to that greater sea of your personal unconscious. And there will always be a new refreshed ego able to see the world. Um, even when you take uh, trips via meditation into alterations of consciousness, the physical world is always going to be here when you come back. And um, it, when you understand that, then you have the relaxation and the spaciousness necessary to step back long enough to get a retrospective on how your life has been going. Um, if you're grabbing on too tight, like the universe will fall away if you aren't um, holding it up, then you never give yourself a respite to stop and ask yourself how things have been going. I had this image in my mind of like, if the post, the, the, this postmodern malaise, it's like taking, it's like taking life and putting it in a blender so that your whole life becomes baby food and you can swallow it. It's just going like, nothing matters. Anything's, anything I do is ultimately relative to something else. So I'm just going to go, just take all my like pain and joy and just like blend it into a paste so that I can swallow it. <laughs> That's, um, well, it's in the, it's an, an, it's an enabling tool to be leveraged by your unconscious fears. Prior, yeah. prior to developing a conscious relationship with your fear response, it will grab the reins with any excuse available to it to provide you with the easy way out of something. Yeah, because I do that sometimes. And the postmodern malaise yeah. provides your fear response with the perfect set of excuses to not pursue what you want. Saying you Here, don't... Just you don't matter, saying life doesn't matter, saying meaning is an illusion, values are an illusion. Yeah, it's like- Your perception of yourself is an illusion. It's taking the attitude that the reality is undifferentiated and you don't have any hope of differentiating it. Like, so just, you, yeah. know, you know in your heart that none of that is true. You know in your heart that you matter and that you have values and that suffering is bad, and there are also good things that provide pleasure. You know all that, but your fear response is able to seize those excuses of, no, it's all meaningless, um, so that you don't have to take the hard road um, of achieving what you want. And that's another reflection of like being afraid that if that there, there's a, this cliff's edge for your uh, fragile, immature, undeveloped ego self. Like, uh, oh, if I get what I want, there will be nothing past that point. Mm. 
but um, so I'm gonna be content just to like titillate myself for all eternity, going like I could get what I want if I really wanted it, but I don't really want it. I'm content to just sort of like imagine that I'm moving towards that, never really getting there. Yeah, because you're afraid yeah. that getting there, the simulation would end, and it would just be like a glitch screen or the debug menu. Um, so it's like you're afraid of having nowhere left to go, and so you just like settle into going nowhere, so that you can always leave the door open, that you can go somewhere if you want. Yeah. Right. And so if if you don't get if you don't get to achievement and get to the private ending of your private story you'd like to get to, then you'll never have the experience of how procedurally generated and infinite and infinitely meaningful uh, this world is. Um, winning the game opens you up to more meaningful games to possibly win from that point. Do you think that people like act out, like if you're afraid of something, like if you're afraid of something, I think it's possible to like something people do, something I do sometimes without knowing it is like, if I'm afraid of something, I almost like create a simulation of the thing I'm afraid of so that I can deal with the thing I'm afraid of, but it's not the real thing. It's like a facsimile. Yeah. Like you, you have a way of fulfilling your own fears because you can't actually face the thing. And so you create a little micro version of it to explore that thing like you're like if you're afraid of talking to people you can have all these conversations in your head yeah you know like and people who are like that people who have social anxiety and i'm very familiar with this i grew i I don't feel like i was able to really connect with people when i was younger because i was really in my head and i'm still in my head to a large extent and being in your head is incredible the amount of interpersonal imagination somebody has who's in their head yeah. And so in that sense, it's a perfect example of like imagination being a, a substitute for reality. Especially when you lean on that. When you lean on your imagination a lot, it's so easy to bring that to bear and m- make it be like this layer that goes between you and the world where you're kind of fighting battles within yourself instead of fighting battles without yourself. Well, it's super handy because um, it opens up the sometimes limited power of your will mm. uh, in the present moment to work on something yeah. that it right. feels able to work with. Yeah. And so you can't face your fear, okay, but you can conjure a phantom of your fear uh, in the present moment and deal with that. Um, and there's an argument there I used to have for like the usefulness of psychedelics. Um, like not everyone if, n- not everyone um wants to pursue extreme sports um but everyone most everyone can benefit from an extreme experience and you can via psychedelics uh, with proper set and setting you can face the extremities of yourself uh with complete assurance of physical safety and that's a way where you can like face your fears before you face them you can hide from the warrior archetype your whole life if you just are really into football and that's the thing that gives you that energy i feel like sports are a simulation like we talked about this before that sports are a way of like sublimating the war instinct in people i don't know sports are Team sports, certain sports like football. Teams, team sports, uh, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> but Alex, you and I are perhaps not the kind of person who, you see what I'm saying? We have somewhat somewhat of a shared bias. Yeah, I have a yeah. bias because I'm my, my frame right. early on didn't seem to be built for it. I'm like imagining an alternate universe where you're like, <laughs> Like a quarterback. <laughs> so, bro, did you catch the game? Like, and we talk about that on the podcast. No, 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 no. I, I tried. Uh, <laughs> I tried as much as I could to get into football. You want to do a? I, sha- you should I, do a shadow work episode. It's called the Alex and Stewart Sports Cast, <laughs> where we just just fuck up. We try. It would be so we just comical. Bro, down. Oh, it would be. For the whole time. Okay, you want to talk about getting out of your comfort zone? <laughs> that would be pretty far out of my comfort zone. I'd be like. 
So, <laughs> anyone who's watching this, this is not normal, okay? This doesn't represent me. <laughs> me. You understand? Because yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. That's... I like to navigate around this. Like I like to take a very high-minded approach and go like, hmm, a simulation of war. What are those? What are they doing? Out <laughs> fighting over a ball? I know what's really going on. It's some it's some young and shit, and they're just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> this is fun. We're just having fun, and I'm sitting here yeah. like, hmm. see, I'm Physically. afraid. I'm, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. If I knew what I was talking about, I'd be I'd be well, more charitable. I don't know. It's physically fun. Um, I was forced to play football in high school, and, so I and, have a little perspective on this. And getting getting physically into your body and roughhousing is great. Right. But, like, the specific iteration of it, of football, it destroys your fucking body. And there's, yeah, there's a belief baked into it that combat and, and violence is inherently necessary to aggression. And to physical aggression, physical aggression equals violence, and violence, it's not even a zero-sum game. It's like a negative-sum game. It destroys the winner and the loser. Um, so if my disdain for football has a root that's valid at all, then that is it. This um, is violence. Violence itself is... Um, evolutionary and needing to be cast off and in that sense football is super necessary we we need to cast simulations that are more and more peaceful that still successfully channel our aggression yeah but ultimately you have to channel your aggression creatively you have to take the reins of your conscious mind with its perception of an aggressive animal nature and figure out for yourself how you're going to use that aggression to build something that didn't exist before. Yeah. Um, not take something by force from other people and other beings. Yeah, this is to say that... Um, and so in that sense, right. football is an amazing step towards mm. that from war. Yeah. Yeah, vi violence is the simplest... That's, I've often said, like, violence is the simplest form of politics. It's the uh, simplest manifestation of aggression. It's the simplest, most basic, most blunt uh, fallback consensus mechanism. Um, and uh, we do a lot. We do well to play better games. And uh, maybe a game like football is a step in the direction of playing better games. Um, I, I think of something like, uh, you know, like something like that is like. Obviously, you know, it's a cultural institution, but it's a little bit less interesting than thinking about how that manifests itself within an individual person, like in your own life. Like, like you say, you know, you're, to me, it seems like you channel your, to me, you're a very, a very good example of someone who channels their aggression creatively, because I wouldn't look at you and think that you're like, you know, you don't have like neck tats. I don't think like you're going to like beat me up or something. You don't have like that, like. You know, like, you don't look like you've been in prison. You know you know what I mean? But, like, mm -hmm. get, since I get to know you, there's definitely this thing where, like, I see it's more subtly expressed. Um, when, you, when you talk about what you're creating, I can definitely see that bleeding through. I can tell that if you weren't working on uh, creative projects, you would probably need, to, you would need to ground that energy out somewhere because yeah. you, you're contending with it. You have to do something with it. Yeah, I am contending with it. And I was, I was programmed by being raised by my mom uh, with an absent dad. I was, yeah. I was programmed against violence of any kind. Uh, very, very deeply, very, very deep prohibitions against violence. So all aggression, if it wasn't managed to be channeled creatively, it would be turned against myself. And you see reflections of that in my suicidal ideation. Where, yeah. Where if I don't know what to do with the monumental amounts of uh, perception and energy and uh, integration, uh, then like it's it gets turned on myself by yeah. um, programming of my childhood, yeah. rather than like 
uh, acting out in a, a criminal fashion or beating somebody up or or some other like outward distortion. Dude, fucking even like heavy metal music is um is like quite explicitly a something like dealing with that whole de- dealing with that realm of consciousness. I think that it's so necessary in the world. Yes, I'm trying to um, model what a man can do with his aggression in terms of creativity. And via heavy metal as a genre of expression, I'm trying to show that uh, violence is weak bitch aggression. And once you figure out how to make it creative, then your aggression can get way more aggressive. Um, because it's not destroying everything in its path. You, it's every, more sustainable. It's, it's generative, it's sustainable, and so it can get even more extreme. Right. So I'm trying to show that like, it's not a cop-out of your aggression, aggressive impulses to make art with it. It's taking your aggressive impulses seriously and uh, creating a productive place for them in the world. Yeah, it's, it's not a way of like, it's not a way of backing down. It's not a way of escaping. It's a way of trying to maximize the act, like the overall expression of something by not immediately burning your entire house down. Yep, yep, there's some like sex metaphor there. Of like, not, there's always a sex metaphor. Yeah. Not immediately going for orgasm. <laughs> yeah. Just like, let's do this. Yeah. Oh, I'm slightly uncomfortable right now. I'm just gonna immediately uh, translate that as a sexual impulse and immediately go for orgasm, so I don't have to think about that sexual impulse. Have you ever at all. tried to see how fast you can come though? <laughs> Just as an experiment. Come on, everyone's tried that. Everyone's been curious, right? Just like, just to try to yeah. figure out like what are like the like actual physical limits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've totally wondered about that hypothetically. Yeah. <laughs> you you definitely have to engage much more of your <laughs> unconscious like Freudianness and like think less about it. In, in my experience of when I've ch- like challenged that and tried to do it as fast as possible. Um, damn it, I was gonna say something interesting and then that derailed me, <laughs> fuck. Um, uh, heavy metal, aggression, creativity, violence. <sighs> fuck. Um, oh yes, this was, uh, it reminded me, I had this idea about like, um, you know what really grinds my gears? <laughs> it's the meme, meme format. You know what really grinds my gears? Uh. Fact checkers. Fucking pisses me off. Yeah. Okay, I don't even know what facts they're checking. I don't care. <laughs> the word fact checker grates me the wrong way because it's like, I think that there is a, um, my prompt was uh, the humanistic case against fact checkers. Yeah. Because when I see, when I experience this grating dissonance with the word fact checker. I want to approach this not from like the like, like you can like I, I don't want to have like a like um like a MAGA reaction to this because it's I feel like there is something there's a way more powerful criticism that that goes beyond politics that goes beyond the provincial issues that are currently affecting whatever like the world social networks and stuff. I mean, in a much larger sense, I think that fact checkers are, it's so embarrassing. Well, fact checkers show a person's unwillingness to do the necessary work of discovering the universe themselves. I'm embarrassed for humans. I'm embarrassed for us as people. You cannot, you cannot uh, export your responsibility to discover the world onto other people. I think that a society where fact checkers are a thing is is very embarrassing. And I am ashamed of this society. <laughs> Come on guys, we don't need fact checkers. Is this training wheels? <laughs> like, yay, we're the human race. We're just riding our training wheel bicycle. Okay, like, well, you, you know? don't 
Stuart, you don't understand the position boomers find themselves in. Oh, I didn't think about that angle. They, they are babies with their limbs just flapping in the air, and these younger generations are just blazing ahead with zero understanding of uh, leaving all of them behind. So is fact-checking... They, like, is that the boomer reality reconciliation layer? There's a lot of them, and fact-checking is one of them. Like, an example is my mom, like... I couldn't uh, further my conversation about uh, COVID and vaccines with her um, the way the next step I was ready to because the next step requires her to listen to a Joe Rogan episode. Oh. And so she has to know what Spotify is. And so she has to be like, oh, this is a real thing because there's a company associated with it. Or and, something like that. And she has to know, like, how to work her computer enough to get Spotify and, like, know where the search fucking bar is on the app. None of these are, like, natural givens for a boomer. They're all of these, like, stretches of intellect. And a lot of them have just already given up. And they're like, I'm not going to even go there. I'm just going to keep watching Channel 8 or whatever channel it is, and CNN tells me Joe Rogan is evil and misinformation uh, spreading, and they showed me a clip of him uh, saying something really inappropriate, so I know it's true. And, and so, like, these things like fact checkers are, like, totally welcomed by these people who have been very left behind and have no idea how to get their bearings in this new world. Here's what I see happening. I think that fact-checking is going to be a thing that greatly limits how much fun humans are allowed to have in the future because, you know, whatever, COVID misinformation is stupid. Everyone's sick of talking about it. But that is the context in which fact-checking has sprung up, okay? But the thing about... Once you have, like, a fully, a devoted section on, like, a news aggregator website that is a little box that is called Fact Check that has just the daily, like, little line items of, like, this is not true, this is not true, don't you dare think about this, don't worry about this, okay, somebody said this, but really, like, it's this little thing of just going, like, no, no. No. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. It, it, it's like this, like, um, overbearing mom energy where, like, when I was a kid, yeah. I would be like, I want to have do things that are fun. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, yeah. it's, what is that? Like, how is, the, is there an institution that people accept is telling them no? What? Like, what? Like, so what, what's going to happen is this fact checker thing is going to become established and then let's say like 10 15 years from now we're not going to be talking about covid like hope to god we're not talking about covid still but we're probably not going to be we're talking to be talking about something else things might even be good in the world right but then there's going to be something like some new cultural thing where people are like oh maybe we could you know change our lifestyle in a way where we would really be a lot happier and healthier but it's just as like kind of countercultural, mm-hmm. and then the fact checker apparatus is going to be directed against it, uh-huh. and they're going to be like, "No, humans are not allowed to live in, you know, whatever little hippie utopia people figure out or something." Is it's going to be like this thing that's just as sort of uh, is like a like retards the advancement of the human race, and that's why and a society that admits that honestly deserves it. It's just embarrassing. Like we need to be more excited about we need to think it's like we need to have a more tolerance of fucking up otherwise we're not going to have any fun well I, I remember the moment I knew that the new experiment of fact checking was done was when a family member um, over the last the years leading up to this became more and more and more dissociated from reality and more and more and more ideological and more and more and more vert, like SJW and then moved to New York 
and then the, their day job was for Facebook fact checking. Like in, in this person's most ideological, unbalanced, insane part of their lives that I'd ever seen, that was their job was checking facts on Facebook. We are going to look back <laughs> at this point in history and go like, wait, so you're telling me there was a website called Facebook <laughs> and this, and they checked facts? <laughs> like, like, and, and then there's gonna, it's gonna, the kids in like the future are gonna be like, oh, no way, no way, you mean there was this guy and he, and he, and he hired people to say what was true? Like, they're not gonna have any idea that like we went through this weird moment as a society where we're like things are weird, uh, corporation. What's true? Like <laughs> like like what? Whoa! You know? Because like in that time, I think like in the future, like you know something something Web three something something consensus reality democratization whatever. I think that's going to get a little better in the future. We're going to solve this problem, but this weird issue we have right now, where we have this need, we're like come, we're like. We just stumbled out of the doorway of, like, pre-modernity into, like, the glaring light of, like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Things are complicated. So we are, like, almost, like, flinching at it and needing and, and taking this raw kind of, like, uncertainty. And, I mean, I'd like to think this is just for boomers, but mm -hmm. I don't know if it's just for boomers. I think that there's also young people who probably are like a little more savvy on like what probably they have like more adaptability like they're not going to be like as dependent on this fact check thing but it's like the fact check is not is like an ethos i think it's like an attitude yeah that says there is a right answer and or not only that there, but not that not even that there's a right answer but that there is a socially correct answer that's right what is yeah. this socially correct answer like how limiting of an idea is that because if you say there's a socially correct answer okay maybe there is but maybe that's not going to always be that way. And what you're doing is you're calcifying your commitment to some kind of... So, so it's dogma. It's like we're just admitting like, yep, we need dogma again. We thought we yeah. got rid of dogma. We had this liberal mindset that was like, oh, we're going to be free thinking. And, you know, but, and then it got out of hand and then now we're afraid. So we're going to go right back to dogma. Well, we're, Come on. We're all figuring it out as we go. Um, like... The first couple weeks of lockdown, the first month or two of lockdown, like it was a good idea to accept that there are unknowns and better safe than sorry. And then from those first two months to now, like the amount of actually credible information about the phenomenon and about the way the virus is structured has been like very few and far between for me of sources that I can tell ha don't have um, adverse incentives um, and are able to present the truth as they see it. Um, and we all just have the responsibility as individuals to get better and better and better at perceiving truth and cross-referencing truth. Mm -hmm. um, and my example in this moment is uh, like three different podcasts on Joe Rogan in the last month or so. And one of them was uh, Peter McCullough, a doctor. And another one is this like gruff, square-faced beard, uh, technology science doctor who invent who owns like nine of the ten patents of inventing mrna vaccines mm -hmm. and then adam curry is the third guy just a commentator um lives in austin uh inadvertently invented podcasts um oh the og podcast dude yes yeah I know that guy. And they're mm -hmm. from McCullough to the mRNA inventor to Adam Curry. Oh. There's this distance, further and further distance from actual facts to back up any given paragraph of their conversation. And uh, it's up to you to discern where your prejudices want to agree with that sentence. So it's okay that it's not backed up. 
and that's a kind of truth, but that's different from McCullough saying, this study says these exact statistics from which I derive my personal opinion that A is true. And that was three hours of the McCullough podcast. He had his laptop up in front of him with all his documents available to like say the exact facts and with every fact and every paper point out the exact doctor or set of doctors who made that thing and would occasionally have like, and here's the uh, challenging argument by these people and what, and here's the limits of that um, test. Like everything he had to say was backed up by like three more layers of uh, truth um, and then still punctuated by those are just statistics this is the opinion I make out of those statistics. Mm. And then the mRNA guy, he didn't have any preparation. He didn't have any information in front of him. He, like, just had anecdotes. Mm. And because he's, like, one of the most established doctors in the world and regularly has worked with the FDA and with huge government bodies and with huge corporations to like spearhead technology of making medicine like his anecdotes hold a certain amount of weight but he was not telling you that point at which his opinion took the thrust of the paragraph he was saying over objective truth Mm -hmm. he didn't point out when that shift would happen you just have to like perceive that yourself and notice that no specific research papers are being referenced in his conversation. And he's just like giving you his memory slash his opinion. And then Adam Curry is like the base base of this where he just like is stoned the entire podcast (laughs) and just like says, he just says vibes. And then, like, maybe you agree with this uh, prejudice vibe or that prejudice vibe. And, like, he has... And and every, like, thing backing up his vibe is, like, a private experience with a news article or an anecdote from a friend that he's not even telling you about. He's just telling you his opinion. But all three of these people are saying these statements, like the way you say things conversationally, which is like, this is true. Mm -hmm. But there's different levels of like, how true and what kind of true is this at any given moment? Okay, so I have two things about that. The first thing is that I think that that this, um, I really, really, it occurred to me that I really don't like when things are politicized because it leads to boring conversations because it makes it to where you feel like a little bit of hesitancy when you want to say something that you kind of think because you think you're going to be jumped on for it. And so it leads to this like narrowing, this like limiting of expression that, and this is back to the humanistic thing. It, I like good conversations that involve delicate, deft weaving of intentions and biases and factual statements and see, takes on th- okay so like see mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the only uh, um, rebuttal I have there is like I'm not sure it's possible for conversations to not be political the deeper they go it's just a matter of properly labeling yeah, that's true where you're coming from right and properly discerning okay, this next statement is much less anything true and, like, this next thing I'm about to say is very much colored by this specific political bias that I have. That's what you would Here hope. it is. That's what you would hope. That would be the ideal way to have a political conversation is to properly label all the pieces. And then it can yeah. freely go mm-hmm. political and then go out of political yeah. again. Yeah, because there really is a difference between a political conversation... And a like in, in true a truly political conversation, and a conversation that is just a bunch of like, is just a series of alternating non sequiturs where people encapsulate their ideology and wrap up their dogma with flowery language and deploy it 
mm-hmm. into the next other person's face. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, which is like the, the shouting head, mm-hmm. um, like, uh, sort of like the talking heads you know like they just evolve like into the shouting heads and then pretty soon they're not even, they're not even shouting anymore they're just like <laughs> they're glowering just a, they're just a red face and they're exploding like, like, out the top yeah just like having a vein just bulging in their face they have no one's even said anything yet like that's the limit of like just how fucking boring these conversations are getting i don't even care if you're mad you're boring you're literally sa- so predictable so predictable right and, okay, so but there was a second yeah. thing you that, had the second in thing, response to all the truth. The second thing is layers. that I think that okay, so it's the silver. I'm arriving here at the sil- maybe perhaps the silver lining of the the fact check thing is that at least at least the fact checkers are in the position of reacting. They're one step behind. They're not saying anything original. Every fact check. They are, they are not able to actively steer the conversation no, the, anywhere. It, everything they say is derivative. If you come out against everything anyone says, you're just, it's derivative, man. You're not saying anything cool. And after a while, people are going to get bored of you because you're going to say, why would I look at this derivative thing? I want to see the thing that's real. But in, right. What's most interesting is where things begin. I don't, so you're digging your own grave if you if you position yourself as just being the person who disagrees with everything and you can't even say anything original. So that's the silver lining of it to me is that like I had, this is another thing I was having this conversation last night. Like I came upon this idea that like, I was talking about this thing where I I think that when somebody is basing their ideas, their life, their attitude on your attitude, they're not stealing your ideas. They're giving more power to your ideas. Like, there's this, I, I think the way intellectual property is structured is going to change in the future because right now we have this idea that intellectual property is a thing that is mine and I'm going to defend it by not letting other people use it. Mm-hmm. But, and maybe that's due to the way that we have been able to portray ideas and stuff, but I think that in the future when there's a lot more integration of intellectual property and the abstract things into the physical world, there's going to be a shift in the way that people evaluate how, like it, a shift in how they, pers- like where they think that their ideas have the most power. Instead of being like jealously held, they're going to, be, you're going to have to take your presence, your idea, your original thought, your consciousness, and make it a thing that you hope is the foundation for derivative works. Because the Invade. more people derive from you, the more power, the more authority you have, because yeah. authority is authorship. Yeah, and, and you're pointing out how finding a given article that's been fact checked in the negative just lends more power to the point being portrayed. It lends more reality to it. Because it's reflecting it. Uh, yes. And and that's obviously the way in which Trump won the election in 2016. Yeah, he just made everybody talk about him. He just made everyone talk about him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, yeah, there's uh, more subtle and intelligent ways of signing information coming down the pipe where your IP will have to be shared to be grown. And you'll be able to, it'll, it'll maintain its attribution to you and you won't need to That's right. prevent its distribution because the attribution will be more um, positively linked to you and your yourself, your persona, the source itself will become more of a concrete entity yeah. that doesn't need to be, you don't have to like mortgage yourself into your work because you yourself are a thing that is like seen as the author and you can take this concrete, like, like I am the source. I am the author. And everything that I do is a reflection unto me. And everything you do, that's if you're basing it off something that I do, ultimately that's reflecting light back onto me. Yeah. And yeah, there's, this is more squirrely, but like to enunciate, but when I have personally, uh, when I have more radical ideas, um, to communicate, it matters much less to me whether they're swallowed whole by someone I'm uh, expressing a given radical idea to and more just like grappled with 
Like, I would rather you fight against the idea I just said and try and prove it wrong than to just, like, swallow it whole without challenge and not, like, even focus on it. Um, like, the most powerful ideas uh, are, like, partially wrong and partially right. And it's the important thing is to just grapple with them and cut your teeth against them, not to be possessed by them, but to engage with them. Um, yeah. Like Terence McKenna and Ayn Rand both are my go-to examples of this, where they are premier pioneering thinkers of the modern world, not by being 100% right about the truth of reality, but by their ability to generate new ideas, which themselves generate new ideas in the people hearing those original mm -hmm. ideas. Yep. Because we're still talking about them. Yes. Yeah. Like, Time Wave Zero, it's, like, so flawed. <laughs> but who else is trying to mathematically portray time dilating and contracting? <laughs> <laughs> that's brand new and what that opens up of trying to take that idea seriously is a whole world of personal ideas about perception that you've never had before so thank you Terrence McKenna yeah thanks for being willing to take a step yeah someone has to uh, the comfort zone thing yeah so what takes you out of your comfort zone Alex does anything take you out of your comfort zone <laughs> sure yeah but it's definitely become an appetite <laughs> of stepping, <laughs> stepping out of the comfort zone is a prerequisite almost daily for being able to sleep good <laughs> that night. Um, like the prompt is where do you most, where are you most often able Mm. to step out of your comfort zone. Important distinction, yes. Like, where's your comfort zone <laughs> of, of discomfort? <laughs> um, there's certainly cold showers. Um, God. I, yeah, see, because that would be out of my comfort zone, but it's not where I am able to step out of. I, yeah. I am distinctly not able to step into a cold shower. Yeah, I love it, but it's never easy. Um, it's never easy. It's, I'm always glad I did it, but it's always got some resistance to it. And, um, it's, it's amazing what a great metaphor it is for the comfort zone in general and growth happening outside of it. Um, because you, with a cold shower specifically, you get the feedback from your body saying, yes, that was good. I feel better now. I look better now, says the body. I am healthier now. And like, just, um, you can feel that like, well, there's, there's, yeah, I'm using physical metaphors here, like appetite. And, um, and with the cold shower, the cold shock proteins. Um, that, like, illustrate for you physically how to engage your, uh, your learning curve and um, perceive when something is drawing on your vital energy um like just here uh standing out in the sunlight is more rejuvenating um and restful and then it takes more effort and energy to sit on this rock this cold rock and that's like reflecting the creative effort required to make the next few minutes of the podcast yeah, I got a good warm up over there. I feel like I can do this. <laughs> also, this this moss is helping me out. It's like providing a little bit of an insulation layer <laughs> between my ass and this like super cold rock that's trying to suck the vampire, suck all the energy out of my heat out of my body. Um, so, what about you? 
Or do you most often voluntarily step into discomfort? Um, I think trying to um, uh, telling people things they don't want to hear is hard for me. It's real hard for me. But it, it's something you're able to do. Yeah, sometimes. Um, yeah, I've gotten better at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, because uh, I'm kind of a diplomat. Sure. I have that manner about me that I, I think I, I have kind of a keen sense of where other people are coming from a lot of times. Yeah. And I have also a keen sense of what I want people to think. <laughs> yeah. And I have a very, <sighs> I'm very competent at, approaching things in such a way that I know they'll be well received and that can go too far sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes it's better when I just say things that I know are not going to be well received because there's some value and truth that goes beyond the utility of getting someone to think what you want them to think. Is there any feedback immediate or otherwise that how do you know it's a good thing when you do it? Because I feel better. Because it's there's one set of signals telling you it's a bad thing, and that's why it's uncomfortable to do. So what is that signals that says like this is the right thing to do? Um, I, well, I mean, I think it makes me feel better. I think I feel I get like a different. I, I get a different kind of a response from myself when I. It, it, well, it just it feels simpler to me. It feels like more like a sense of relief that the complexity is lower, and yeah. that I haven't made things too complicated. Because sometimes I think like, God damn it, why did I make it so complicated? Why do I have? Why do I carry around this idea that everything I have, everything I say, has to sound smart and well thought out? Because there's so many things that are not well thought out or yeah. good ideas. Yeah. And there's I I do crave the kind of intellectual intimacy among other kinds of inti intimacy pr like but intellectual in intimacy in particular is like this thing where you feel like you you can expose your uh, your thought process to someone else yeah instead of giving them the finished product and uh yeah i feel like i'm always te i'm always teasing that in conversations i have with people <laughs> like i'm always like subtly signaling to them that like You're like I want to. I want to give you the most real. I want to give you everything I have, but mm -hmm. I also have like this sense of like standards in my brain of like. Maybe I think it, what it comes from is this, uh, like, idea that I I don't want to like abuse people's listening, sure. gift that they give me. Sure. And so, because 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 the truth is, I really love to be listened to. Right. As I suspect most people probably like. Yeah. But I really like to be listened to. I really love it. I love being in that s mode of like having like a willing, willing recipient for like the reality that I'm spinning up. I love that. And so I, I try to like not, I, I try to be like somewhat parsimonious with that, which mm -hmm. sounds funny because by observing me, you wouldn't think I was very parsimonious with it. But I try to be, yeah, I just try to like, I think it goes a little too far sometimes trying to choose my words correctly. And I, I admire people. I'm inspired by people who can get across ideas with just like vibes, mm -hmm. like Alicia, who's a great communicator yeah. in a way that I'm not. Um, and, uh, well, that comes from being sensitive to the cues outside of her enough mm -hmm. that she understands the latent statements already being taken for granted. Yeah, she does. Amongst that specific moment of that specific people. So 
the things one says are then just a tag on top of what everyone already knows. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. That like spatial, emotional, intellectual yeah. awareness. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a tremendous compliment to my type of processing. Yeah, I, uh, I try to be as brutal and as clear uh, and I, pre- I appreciate that about truth you. as yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, I feel like right. because of the background I've already described today, of I'm like almost like biologically programmed <laughs> against violence. Yeah. So I just take it for granted that that comes across enough that there is no threat, physical or intellectual, from me. Um, And so, like, I can say what's on my mind and it'll just come across uh, in a neutral, safe way that, like, no no one's minds needs to be changed. This is the experience I'm having. Um, It's still plenty of times, like, lands with a certain weight uh, into the conversation, like a boulder into a still pond. but there's not much that can be done about that. With, when I'm having like a face-to-face conversation with people where I can tell that there's like huge gulfs of ideological bias between me and the other person, then the kind of really clear truth I resort to is a more interpersonal, like noting the weather together. <laughs> And like, yeah. where are you? What are you doing? And then they yeah. say that. And then I just illustrate my ability to listen by like, do I understand that correctly? You just said this and this and this and this. Yeah. Uh, yes, you've been heard. I heard you. Um, just like zero in very much on like the very specific things that both of us can objectively perceive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to develop that in my own life. The ability to kind of like talk more about people. Talk 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 more directly about like tra- talk more directly to the person I'm talking to. Yeah. And not um talk about something that I know that they can relate to. Yeah. Cuz it's great if we can relate to that, but there's a limiting of how much progress you can make when you stick to things that you know they're going to be well received by people. Yeah. And it, it, I think it lends itself if you take that to the extreme and you d- never develop that interpersonal contention, that comfortability with inter- interpersonal contention, you're going to be a person who is kind of like the uh, like a schmoozer, you know? Right. Someone who can go around and like be just buddy buddy with everyone. But remembered by no one. Remember, yeah, and kind of taken seriously by no one. And I, I'm in the position where like. Amongst my close friends with with whom I have, like, extremely, extremely deep, honest, authentic relationships, I, maybe just the fact that I've had a, a, like close friends my entire life and I've never been without close friends, that has allowed me to almost, like, rest easy in the knowledge that, like, well, I have, like, mm-hmm. a few people that I can be really real with, and so, like, everyone else, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't really... I, it's just not worth it to me to like get into things with you because like I, I don't I just don't really want to but I don't know but at the same time it's like I, I do still want to grow up more and mm-hmm. I want to like fun, make fundamentally new relationships with people mm-hmm. that aren't just like based on the idea that like oh I already have my intimacy needs met I'm just gonna be like fair weather acquaintances with everyone else you mm-hmm. know um cause uh yeah I've, I've realized I'm in the process of realizing maybe since the Molly trip or something but pr- honestly before that too that like there's this seeking towards novelty that I like in, in, com- in coming into contact with where I'm like well I, well I would really like to be surprised I would really love to be surprised because when I was younger, mm-hmm. I didn't need to, I, I was constantly surprised. 
And I feel like the flip side of, of like becoming wiser and older is that you just categorize everything mm-hmm. and, and, you th- and things make more sense to you. And so I realized that emotionally, one of the things that powered me for my whole life was this like um, interest in dealing with all the unexpected things that I didn't understand. And like when I look back, I'm like, oh, I was such an idiot back then. Well, yeah, that's true. But also... I was an excited idiot. I was having fun. It mm-hmm. was good. So yeah. and it, and like that dealing all those like like dumb things I did, you know, all the non-optimal decisions I, I I made were like in the long in the larger sense of things like like they were great, you know. They and, and I I want to kind of I think it's there it comes a point where you kind of have to like voluntarily value that otherwise it'll just slip away. Mm-hmm. You got to forge new relationships with people. And with reality itself. People, people are in some sense like the ambassadors of new reality <laughs> because they, they introduce you to new reality in yeah. a way that they've been mining on some little part, note of reality for a while. And if, you can, if you're willing to open up your self to what they have, it's like, oh, whoa, that's like really cool that you've been, maybe it's something you feel totally comfortable with but I don't feel comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. And maybe I can trade you for something that I feel really comfortable with and I can give it to you. It's like you're, you're bartering these kind of like more well-formed parts of reality with each other, but it requires a lot of trust mm-hmm. in yourself particularly and I suppose the other person too, but primarily yourself mm-hmm. that you're not going to somehow like fumble it or something. Like, I've, I, it's weird, the dissonance to me, how comfortable I am with new ideas. Like, I'm swimming in a sea of new ideas. I love new ideas. Like, I feel like I'm just like a fish in new ideas. And I'm, it's my entire reality is like, I wake up in the morning and just like, new, new, new. Like, I'm, I'm, my, I have so many ideas that I have to constantly write them down. Otherwise, I'll forget them all. So that's very easy for me to deal with. Mm-hmm. What I'm less able to do is deal with new people. Mm -hmm. because I just pigeonhole those people and I go like, well, that would take a ton of energy. Yeah. And the, you you know, but I I think that there's this process where like, yeah, I'm at the point in my life where I'm like, I want to take a more keen active interest in trying to figure out what other people are about Mm -hmm. in ways that are not just confirming my own ideas of what I think they are. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 